make sure we're on it. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sneha Bedi, elected patient governor and lead governor. And on behalf of all the governors, I would like to warmly welcome you all to the trust annual member meeting. Today, we've got a wide uh, range of stakeholders joining us. Our leadership team, our non-exec team, and most importantly, our local membership and other key stakeholders. Due to the current restrictions in place, we will be or having this event virtually, same as last year. And I would like to point out a few housekeeping areas. This event is being recorded and will be posted on our website so that people who didn't get to attend today can view it. Over 400 members have registered for this event and because of that, we have made it up. We've set it up in a way that everyone's camera has been disabled. Everyone has been put on mute and most importantly, the chat functionality has been enabled so that you can share your comments, feedback and any questions that you have during the Q&A sections. So that's going to come in very handy. So moving on to the main event. My role today is to present the key highlights and activities that the Council of Governors have undertaken on your behalf. A Council of Governors represents you, patient, public and staff. So annual members meeting is very important for us so that we can report back to you. In today's uh, meeting, we will be covering a quick overview on what the Council of Governors have been involved with. Uh, chair, uh, our new chair, Mark Lamb, is going to say a few words. Caroline Clark is going to take us through a year like no other. We will talk a lot about research and development and an update on annual account, followed by the Q&A, which I'm sure everybody's quite excited about. So starting with a quick update on Council of Governors. Three of the longest standing member who served their maximum term of nine years have moved on, which is former lead governor Judy Dwenter, Hans Dross and Linda Davis. And we would like to take this opportunity to thank them, along with our previous chair, Dominic Dodd, for his excellent contributions. Every year in this meeting, we report on what the council comprises of. Uh, so the average age of the council as it stands is 51 compared to last year, which was 58. The BAME representation is 40 percent and the female represents the 46 percent of the council. So I would like to bring forward now the key highlights what the council has done over the last year. Despite the COVID circumstances we have been, our council has been fully engaged in performing all their statutory duties, which represents your interest, and also to provide constructive feedback to our board and support them where needed. So the key things that we have been working on is Council of Governors have been effectively involved in recruiting our new chair, Mark Lamb. You're going to hear from him shortly. The Council has been working with the leadership team to ensure that the quality accounts are reviewed and signed off. There's an ongoing process going on to select the new auditors and few of our um, governors have played a very vital role in that. Council of members are involved in various committees and focus groups which look at patient uh, health, population health, innovation, research, patient experience, as well as trust partnership. And we have been quite flexible working with the trust to, to manage change during the COVID times. And most importantly, we manage governor's inbox where you send your feedback, concerns, as well as any suggestions you have. We will share the email address at the end and it will pop up on your screen. And finally, I would like to thank two people who have made this event possible and give them a shout out. Matt Carell, who's our membership um, engagement manager, and he looks after you and us and has made sure that this event runs smoothly. And also the technical lead for the event today, Susan Lau, who's been great in organizing it. And hopefully the event will go smooth without any technical errors. So, and finally, without any further delays, I would pass on to our new chair, Mark Lamb. Uh, thank you, Sneha, for that uh, fantastic uh, uh, summary of uh, what to expect uh, over the next hour, hour and a half. May I begin firstly by warming, um, warmly welcoming all members uh, to our annual event and to thank you for your time uh, and support of the Trust um, uh, throughout this extraordinary year. We've had an extraordinarily hard year uh, and I'm incredibly proud uh, and privileged to have been appointed chair of this fantastic organization uh, and I started in my role in April. Um, the Royal Free London Group has a really proud history 
uh, and its foundations go back some 193 years, we counted now, uh, when the Royal Free Hospital was established to provide free health care to those who could not afford medical treatment. So our roots uh, uh, are uh, by nature altruistic, uh, outward looking, and we carry those values to today. Uh, we continue to be pioneers in healthcare uh, right up to the present day. Uh, and last year in 2020, we were one of the first trusts in the country to admit patients with COVID-19. Uh, I'm sure you will agree that uh, the response of all our colleagues and staff, and indeed the whole of the NHS uh, during the past 18 months has been absolutely incredible and phenomenal. Uh, and uh, on behalf of the board, uh, we're really grateful uh, for everything our teams have done for our communities uh, during uh, the biggest healthcare crisis uh, of uh, within living memory uh, and certainly uh, within our working lives uh, within the NHS. So I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of the trust uh, to thank all our staff for their outstanding efforts. Uh, and in that context as well, uh, to uh, indicate, of course, uh, the, the, that we shall never forget um, uh, the very sad lo uh, loss of lives that we have seen over the last year and that we do continue to see uh, and the loss that so many uh, families have experienced. <clears throat> I would also like to thank the Royal Free Charity uh, for everything that they continue to do to raise funds uh, and also to raise awareness about, about the good work of the Trust and to all of you as members who have supported them uh, in this process. Uh, the charity has been with us all the way uh, on this journey, particularly in last year, uh, and continue to provide the Trust with invaluable support. Uh, they've launched a new appeal called Breaking Point, uh, which you will hear more about later and uh, indeed how you could help uh, support uh, as a member. Looking to the future, uh, there's lots of really exciting work ha happening across the Trust. A construction of a new Maggie Centre, which will begin in the coming weeks to provide support for people with cancer uh, and to their families and friends. Research and development is a key part of our work. A record number of patients and staff were recruited to clinical trials in 2020. You'll hear more about this work shortly. The Pairs Building, which we're really proud of, the new home to UCL's Institute of Immun Immunity and Transplantation is now open and it will take our understanding of conditions like cancer and diabetes, indeed of coronaviruses, uh, to, to a new level. Uh, we also recognise that some of our patients uh, have been waiting longer than we would have liked to have been treated. Uh, we do want to reassure everybody that they have not been forgotten. It's the number one focus uh, for the board and the trust and we're working incredibly hard to ensure our patient, patients get the care that they need uh, according to uh, clinical priority. Uh, and of course, the pandemic has highlighted to all of us that healthcare cannot be delivered in isolation. Uh, we're best working together and we need to collaborate with many of our partners across the health and social care system to ensure that we deliver the, the best care to all our communities. Uh, that is precisely the aim of the Royal Free London Group. It's why we were set up as a group uh, with three major hospitals and we want to ensure that we bring the very best of the NHS uh, to, to everybody. Um, and in that regard, we will continue to work really closely uh, with our associate partners, in particular West Hertfordshire Hospitals Trust and North Middlesex University Hospital Trust uh, in clinical partnerships to share best practices and improve uh, the way that we deliver services. Over time, we passionately believe that this collaboration with other organisations will continue to develop either through growth within the Royal Free Group itself or via our work um, as part of the NHS focus on integrated care systems. You'll be hearing much more about all this work and other work uh, over the coming months, uh, and we look forward to your continued support in the year ahead. Thank you. And with that, uh, I'm going to hand this over to Caroline Clark, the Group Chief Executive, for her reflections. Caroline Clark. Great. Great. Thank you, Mark. Um, well, first of all, Mark, welcome. Welcome to the Royal Free. This is your first annual members meeting um, and we're delighted to have you and very pleased that you joined us. Um, I'm going to take this moment to reflect on um, what's what's uh, I'm not quite sure if my camera's on, actually. Can you see me? Yes, 
Right, sorry, technical hitch number one, everyone. Right, so um, I'm just going to reflect a little bit on uh, the last year, which really was a year like no other. And as Mark has said, that is an experience that uh, hopefully uh, the next generation won't have to go through. Um, and I'm going to take stock of how we did and also then to think forward about what that means for us over the coming period. But before I do that, um, like uh, people before me, I just want to say a few thank yous. Um, and um, as I'm speaking, uh, the team will put on the screen Screen, some patient compliments so you can see what some of our patients um, have said as well, which uh, means a lot to our staff. Um, as I said, it was an extraordinary year like no other, defined by a global pandemic, but there were some other things that happened as well. Um, our response across our group of hospitals was truly exceptional. Um, and of course, I want to pay tribute to every single member of our staff who went above and beyond, who defined what happened by their resilience, their courage, uh, their commitment, um, and their just extraordinary actions, often a great personal cost. So a first massive thank you to every single member of our staff. I also want to thank the leadership of the organisation. The leaders don't always get thanked. I want to thank uh, the clinical and operational leadership for leading the storm at the front line, again, at immense personal cost. I want to thank my executive colleagues at the group and at the sites for your wise counsel, um, your, your, um, your advice and for helping us steer the ship. And I want to thank my non-executive colleagues on the board, past and present, for the tone and direction that you gave us through 2021. That really helped us actually just get on with the job so thank you and then I want to say thank you to the communities that we serve including our membership and our governors thank you so much for all the support the advice the encouragement and sometimes the finance that you gave us over the last uh, year that has really that has really helped us and of course a thank you to our charity I'll say more about that in a minute um, who've been by our side throughout helping support us and rebuild our services um, so first of all then a brief stock take of last year from that first frightening wave when we were experiencing a new disease and a new lockdown and huge uncertainty, then a summer of uncertain recovery, followed by a very, very tough winter. And then finally, I guess a more hopeful um, spring 2021. Do you remember what you were doing on April the 1st last year? Let me just remind you. England had been in lockdown for just one week. We had over 400 patients with COVID in our beds in Barnet and the Royal Free. Our intensive cares were at double their capacity then, and we'd enacted all our pandemic plans and had redeployed hundreds and hundreds of staff from their normal jobs to support that effort. Two days later, just as the London Nightingale Hospital opened, we went into what we call super surge mode. Very quickly, we had 800 patients in our beds. Our intensive care units were at three times their capacity, and we suddenly understood what exponential really meant. We actually saw in that first wave, our first peak was around Easter weekend last year. Do you remember driving around? I remember driving around London between our sites. I remember delivering Easter eggs and it was so quiet on the roads. All you could hear was ambulances. And I don't know if you remember in your back gardens how noisy the birds were. Um, and it was really warm. And our hospitals were strangely quiet as we rearranged everything. We rearranged wards, we built things where they weren't, we learned how to provide care while dressed in new PPE, we enrolled in loads of research projects, more of that later, and then we worried about all the patients who we weren't able to treat because we'd stopped doing some of our non-urgent work and patients weren't being referred. And then we worried about how our staff were coping. Last April, we started a number of initiatives, many of which still exist, to really take the pebbles out of staff's shoes. So we had free food in the canteens, over 350,000 meals we served, a supermarket that had 50,000 visits, food parcels to isolating staff. At one point, we had 1,100 staff out of our 10,000 staff off. That was incredible. We had community chests going to some of our wards. We provided 22,000 nights of hotel accommodation to staff so that they could be at home and not put their family, be at work and not put their families at work. We had free parking, a helpline, wellbeing apps, whatever it took, we tried to do. That was last April. Contrast that with where we were at the end of the financial year, so March 2021. Actually, on March the 31st, 2021, we only had 56 patients with COVID in our hospitals as we came down from what had been a very, very difficult second peak. And just to remind you, so whilst at our peak in April last year, we had 800 patients. In January this year, we actually had 1,526 patients in our beds with COVID at one point. 
So over the whole year, we treated 4,326 patients with COVID. We're now in the middle of the third wave and we currently have a, 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 about 50 patients generally in our beds at any one time and that number changes day to day. Um, and of course, we're running all our usual services at an expanded level and that's what's different about the services today. In order to do all that last year, of course, we made a lot of changes to the care that patients receive. Of course, different drugs and different clinical pathways are now available. But of course, if you and also if you enter any of our hospitals, you will notice some real differences. Um, if you're really interested, I'd recommend watching the BBC's hospital program um, because uh, the team visited us once last April and then again in the summer and autumn to observe how we were restarting our services. Um, Big differences that I perceive in how the hospitals are run now. Of course, we're all wearing masks. Um, we have more security on the doors. Um, it's been really difficult actually with uh, trying to arrange visitors for patients. And that's kind of thing one, one of our staff, one of the things our staff have found hardest, I think, is uh, where patients haven't been able to have visitors because we're trying to keep everybody safe from infection. Um, we might take your temperature if you come into the hospital. We've got loads of new spaces. We have a new ward, the Rainbow Ward in Barnet. We have new intensive care units. We have new wellbeing spaces for our staff. The emergency de departments just look completely different. And I want to just pay tribute to the flexibility and agility of all our staff in making those changes happen. During that second winter, there was a bit of light. We had news of successful vaccine programmes and we were one of the first trusts to be able to give vaccinations to our staff and patients. Subsequently, we've been delighted to work with colleagues across North Central London and with a team at Stone X Stadium on mass vaccination for the wider population. And personally, I'm totally astounded at the way the NHS has managed to stretch itself to be able to save so many lives. You're going to hear from Professor Daryl and Hughes later about our research efforts, but really another astounding feature is that not only are we now, we have opened the wonderful Institute for Immunity and Transplantation, but we're also opening a clinical research facility, something that we've wanted to do for many, many years in this organisation. So COVID dominated the headlines, but there were some other things that happened last year. So you may be interested to know that we delivered 7,864 babies, which is kind of a normal year for us. That didn't stop. We saw 208,000 patients in our emergency departments for all sorts of conditions, not just COVID, and we operated on 17,850 patients. There's more detail about that in our annual report if you want to. But despite all that, we still have record numbers of patients on our waiting lists. They're about 25% bigger than they used to be. And actually, our emergency departments and our urgent care systems are 25% busier than they used to be. And our staff, whilst doing a fantastic job, are exhausted and they're anxious about winter. We don't always get it right, of course. We received a report from the CQC, the Care Quality Commission, our regulator about our maternity services last year following a tragic death of a patient, and it highlighted a number of deficiencies in the service. Our staff have worked incredibly hard to make uh, the necessary improvements, and they've done really well, but we know that we've got more work to do. To all those patients where we've fallen short, I'm truly sorry. Please know that we'll learn from our mistakes and we'll always try and provide the best possible care and do better next time. Taking all that's happened in that year, and again, you can read about this online if you're interested, there, I think there are four immediate, pri immediate priorities for the organisation and Mark's touched upon these. So the first thing, of course, is we've got to reduce the number of patients waiting. The anxiety and stress that people experience and the pain that they experience on waiting lists is not, not acceptable. And we are working night and day across North Central London to try and address that. Second priority, of course, is our amazing workforce without whom we are nothing. Many of our colleagues are shattered. We're gearing up for another busy winter uh, and we will redouble our efforts to ensure that we look after both the physical and psychological health of all our colleagues across the organisation. There's no one magical solution, um, but we will keep trying to do everything that we can with our staff uh, to make life in the NHS as good as it can be. Our third priority is to ensure that we take full advantage of the technology available to us uh, to help patients get better access to services and to make our working lives easier. We're going to see more technological change in the next 10 years than we have over the last century, I think, in biotech, in new medicines and devices, in data processing and storage and connectivity. And we've got to ensure that the raw free is at the forefront of all that. And we've got to do it in a way that allows us to reduce inequalities in the population rather than exacerbate them. So that's super important. Um, and next month, of course, many of my colleagues are working on an upgrade to our major clinical system that will take place across the group um, and massively improve our, our ability to help patients and provide better care. Finally, 
we can't do any of this on our own. As Mark said, we work in many partnerships. It's critical to how we worked in COVID. We learned a lot about how to work in an integrated manner through COVID, and we've got to do more of that. We've got increasingly close partnerships, as Mark said, with West Hearts and with the North Middlesex, um, and latterly with the RNOH, and they are allowing us to test new ways of working really quickly. We also have a fantastic partner in the Royal Free Charity, and I'm proud to be a trustee of that charity. I know that the NHS has received some more money recently, but I've got to level with you to say that a panic, a pandemic is very, very expensive. The underlying position of the Royal Free has not gone away. We still have costs that are much higher than the money that we get in. And I think that the work that we're going to do with the charity and them launching their, um, their breaking point fundraising campaign is absolutely mission critical. I am an optimist, although it feels tough right now. I do think that there are things that we've learned that will make us stronger. And in finishing, I'd just like to say that as we enter another tough winter, I'd like to think that William Marsden will be proud of the, of the, the, the way that the hospital that he founded just before the cholera epidemic in the 1830s has risen to, risen to the modern COVID challenge and also is rising to the philanthropic challenge. So thank you very much for listening to me. Very happy to take questions. And now I think I'm going to hand over to Daralyn, Professor Hughes. Thank you, Caroline. So I'm uh, Daryl Hughes. I'm a haematologist. That's a blood doctor. I treat people with uh, blood conditions and rare genetic disorders. And I'm also the clinical director of research and development at the Royal Free. And I'm very pleased to have been asked tonight to explain to you some of the activities uh, that have been ongoing over the last year in research uh, at the Royal Free and with our colleagues in UCL uh, and other areas. Uh, see if I can get the next slide. So what is clinical research and why is it so important? So clinical research is how we develop new treatments and get better knowledge so that we can understand conditions and develop new interventions for healthcare. And this is really important because not only does it deliver new treatments for patients, but we know that it's also associated with better patient outcomes. And in hospitals that are active in research, even patients who are not themselves involved in trials tend to benefit from having research ongoing around them. There was a case that's been published which shows us that in a hospital which had ongoing active research into people with bowel cancer, the other people with bowel cancer who weren't involved in the trials also did better. So we believe that research is really beneficial to everybody in the hospital and in our health system. And it's now valued in terms also of the CQC well-led framework. Next slide. There's lots of other reasons why clinical research is also really important. So it builds teams and it builds a sense of contribution and well-being to clinicians and to patients. It enables patients to have close monitoring and support. It gives earlier access to new treatments. I look after a group of patients with very rare disorders and in order to bring them treatments, it means bringing together patients from all over the world to participate in research, but has brought them treatments much earlier than they would have done if we'd not been able to have that participation. It brings knowledge generation and it brings wealth generation to the economy and the healthcare economy in particular. Next slide. So I think it's really important as clinicians at the Royal Free that patients are at the beginning and the middle and the end of all our research. Our research starts with understanding the needs of our patient populations. And I've given an example here of kidney disease. Dr. Shabir Michala is one of our renal physicians and he's conducted careful clinical observations and audits of patients with kidney stones. He's found that many patients have recurrences of stones and many of them also have bone disease. And he's used those observations to design clinical trials and to enlist in clinical trials which will benefit our patients. Our patients are our local population around Chase Farm, around Barnet and around the Royal Free Hospitals. 
but also our specialist and rare disorder population and patients travel from all over the country and some internationally to come to some of our specialist units at the Royal Free. Next slide. Laboratory research allows us to understand the causes of disease. So having defined that question, the condition that we want answers to, be it COVID or cancer or some other rare genetic disorder, then we can take samples from patients and take them back into the laboratory, such as in the PERS building or in the Cancer Institute, to try to understand what is causing those conditions and to try to understand ways of disrupting the condition, disrupting the disease and bringing new treatments. And that's why the PERS building and other labs on the Royal Free site are so important to us and that alignment of having them so close to the patients is really important. We need to make sure that as clinicians, we're trying to understand what questions would bring benefit and liaising with our laboratory scientist colleagues to find answers to those questions. Next slide. Laboratory research also helps us to find new treatments and new very early treatments which may have never been tested in patients before. And so I'm so pleased that our clinical research facility, which has just opened this year, will allow us to test very new treatments in patients. You can see here a picture of the CRF. It will allow us to have uh, excellent nursing care, data acquisition around our clinical trials, but to do it in a way which is really safe for patients to have uh, trials of very new treatments. An example of these is gene therapy, and you can see here Amit Nathwani and Pratima Chowdhury, who've pioneered gene therapy in bleeding disorders, and brought the very first new treatments for haemophilia B in terms of a gene therapy, which has now brought benefit to those patients for over 10 years. Next slide. But it's not only new treatments that we want to bring to our patients. Our clinical research infrastructure across the whole group of hospitals allow our researchers and patients to work together to try out new treatments for a whole range of disorders and to also use data to try to understand even more about those conditions. During COVID, we had scientists and researchers working in many areas of the condition and participated in the recovery trial. We recruited many hundreds of patients, both at Barnet at the Royal Free into interventional studies, trying out new treatments for COVID. Recovery brought us the knowledge that very simple treatments with steroids, such as dexamethasone, would benefit patients. We also worked on more complex treatments, antibodies treatments and other interventions. And we're very proud of our recruitment uh, into clinical trials last year of over 8,000 patients. That's the most uh, clinical trial participants at the Royal Free in any single uh, year. You can see here also pictures of new technology where we've ongoing clinical trials. The picture on the left hand side is a very special sort of image of a heart showing us where changes in the heart might occur, either in COVID, but in other conditions that affect people uh, with many different uh, underlying problems. We have many collaborators. We've worked with the National Physical Laboratory to develop something that we've called a pruning board. This is a way of safely allowing people to have breathing assistance on their tummies. And you can see here, actually one of our anaesthetists demonstrating that. That enables them to be safely turned in that way, which helps them breathe with COVID pneumonia. The team on the right hand side is Dr. Swampner Mundal, who has worked on different ways of monitoring sleep in patients and won an award uh, for her way of monitoring sleep and of uh, investigating sleep disorders in different patients. And we think that will be really important in understanding uh, the syndrome of long COVID and the way that also affects sleep. We're very proud of our collaborations with UCL and with the Royal Free Charity and also uh, with the Interventional Surgical Sciences uh, Centre, where we have a number of our surgical colleagues working across London to bring different sorts of surgical interventions and treatments uh, for our patients. And the example that I have on the middle, Rhapsody, is a way in which our work in rare disorders has led to an understanding of more common disorders. 
So Rhapsody is a study where it's been noted that people who have a condition called Gaucher disease, which is uh, very common in, uh, in our Ashkenazi population in North London, have uh, more likelihood or their relatives have more likelihood of getting Parkinson's disease. And that study has led to great insights into the common disorder of Parkinson's. Next slide. Once we've done the research, we've carried out the trial, we've understood the condition and we've uh, worked out a way of bringing the biology of the condition into a treatment, then it's really important that we bring home that benefit. And this is an example from Professor William Rosenberg using some new treatments for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and hepatitis C, which have reduced unnecessary referrals to hospital by about 80% have brought savings to Camden of over £200,000 and brought to us at the Royal Free the largest treatment centre for hepatitis C, curing over 3,000 people from that condition and thereby reducing deaths from liver failure. Next slide. So in the future, we look to increasing collaboration and translational research with the interface between the PERS building and laboratory science and our clinical teams more new early phase studies in the clinical research facility and also these important emerging areas of research of genomics, trying to understand the genetic causes of disease, gene therapy and other advanced therapeutics where we're going to be trying to uh, effectively cure genetic disorders by introducing new genes, tissue regeneration, trying to uh, grow new tissues and organs for those people who have failing tissues, and using our data to generate the best possible hypotheses and outcomes from our data. Next slide. So finally, I'd just like to invite you to help us to develop our vision for the future of research and development at the Royal Free. We're just about to embark on a project to look at our research strategy over the next five years using a combination of town hall events, meetings like this, focus groups, workshops and surveys. And I would love it if we could have your input and support in developing that strategy. And for anyone who wants to be involved, we can share with you the links and the invitations to those meetings. So thank you all for your uh, attention. I'm really pleased to take any questions, which I think we'll do at the end. And I'm now going to hand over to Peter Ridley, who's our Chief Finance and Compliance Officer uh, for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Um, and I'm not sure how to advance my slides, so Matt, could you do that for me? Um, so hi, I'm Peter Ridley, I'm the, I'm the Group Chief Finance and Compliance Officer. Um, I'm going to take you through a quick presentation on our on our year end financial results as of the 31st of March. But could I have the next slide, please? So, so I guess importantly to start, um, and and some of you indeed have just been in in a governor's meeting where we've been talking about um, our auditors, um, our external auditors who were PwC um, for the year just completed, um, carried out their usual work. Um, it's important to to report here that we got a clean opinion from them, so they were satisfied the accounts gave a true and fair view um, of our position. Um, there were no changes made during the audit. Um, there was there was one uncorrected misstatement, which was well below um, the materiality level to, to need to make the change um, and we were found to have exercised our functions economically efficiently and effectively and um, as you'll probably appreciate it was it was a, an, an extremely difficult year to audit given the the changes in our finances which I'm about to take you through and um, so thanks should go to our auditors for, for helping us through that process um, and next slide if I could um, so at a very high level, and I'll take you through some of these numbers, where we got to last financial year, um, we recorded a, a relatively small deficit of 2.7 million for the year. Um, that was in line with forecast and our, and our position as approved by the regulator. Um, the small miss was due to something called an annual leave accrual, which I'll come to. Um, we spent £72 million on capital. I'll give you a little bit of a breakdown on that um, and I'll take you through the savings, which, which are significantly lower than you'd expect in a normal year, as I think you'd probably appreciate. Um, the key probably here is the, the financial regime, how we were paid 
had a very it was significantly different during the year and the whole NHS in England system changed to make sure that that cash flowed to organizations to help them deal with the pandemic to make sure teams weren't tied up um, significantly in in lots of contractual discussions as to a commissioner and a provider split and, and in fact the the whole conversation was how can the national team help how can we make sure as long as your costs seem reasonable we get the cash to the front line so that you don't have to worry about the money you can concentrate dealing with what's in front of us uh, and we met all our expectations there and um, but if i can go to the next the next slide and um, so this is our, our top level position and um, as you'll see if you compare the two columns the right hand column of which is the previous year and then we've got got the column for 2021 the numbers look quite different so some really big increases in numbers there and um, our income um, went up significantly. When you see both those those numbers, the 1099 number and the 214 number below it, and um, the the main reason for those increasing was the additional financial support we got for for going through COVID. So we got um, 77 million pounds of system top ups of one sort or another, which included um, nine million pounds to to help us um, get activity from from. Um, other sectors, so treating patients in independent sector hospitals and other places. Um, we got um, significant amounts of money to, to deal with um, COVID expenditure, which I'll come to, so additional cleaning, security, additional staff and the like. We got um, extra money, £5 million for vaccine hubs for testing. We got um, reimbursed for some of the money we spent on the Nightingale as part of the Greater London effort. And we also got supported for things like lost incomes from, from private practice, which which was stood down while we used those facilities for NHS patients. So a very significant increase in our income, the vast majority of which was to support us as we went through COVID. And um, operating expenditure went up for very similar reasons. So, so that £154 million increase in what we spent during the year, um, £66 million of that is additional staffing costs um, and us also having to take um, what we call a provision for the fact our staff weren't able to take their annual leave and you, ne you need to recognise that in your accounts for, for leave that will be taken in subsequent years. Um, we got significant uh, additional spend in the testing we had to do as an organisation. We had 15 million pounds of COVID costs around estates and facilities, so we've already talked about catering, about cleaning, um, portering and all of the other costs we put in to support the COVID effort, um, as well as the 14 million pound additional costs of drugs um, and additional costs of, of completing the, the Chase Farm programme. So, so the numbers look quite extraordinary compared to the previous years um, and, and COVID is, is the main reason for that. The, the other thing I'll just pick out um, lower down there, you'll see the finance expenses and PDC dividend expenses um, swapped over. Uh, I'll come to that when we talk about our balance sheet, but there's been a change in the way um, the, the long term funding of our trust um, it, it works in terms of borrowing versus effectively a, a, a shareholder investment in us. So I'll come to that, but those numbers changed as well. So um, quite a quite a change in our financial position and therefore quite a challenge to audit but we came out of this delivering the target we needed we needed to deliver and if i could go to the next slide please um I won't go to, into this in any any great detail, but just to give you a sense of where the where the income comes from and where we spend our money. Um, in terms of income, it continues to be most significantly from CCGs, which are clinical commissioning groups, and they are local bodies who commission our more our more standard district general hospital services. So that that continues to be to be our largest element. Then we then have 36% from specialist commissioning. So to pay for the the services you wouldn't expect to find in every hospital. So particularly things like our transplant programs and other things that, that we that we do for a much wider geography of patients. Um, on the expenditure side, um, staff costs just about still make up our, our, our majority of our expenditure and we are slightly unusual in the NHS that it's not a higher percentage and that's in part because we've got such a big drugs bill because of the nature of the services we deliver here in cancer and some of our specialist services. If I could go to the next slide. 
Um, in terms of efficiencies, we would typically aim to deliver about forty million pounds of efficiencies, but but clearly the last year was was not the year to to attempt to deliver um, cost cutting schemes of one sort or another. What we did manage to achieve is some savings around some of our state's services, and we still managed to achieve some non pay and procurement savings. So we managed to do some better deals on some of the things we bought, and um, but. Last year was not the year to push savings, and indeed we were we were we were given that permission by national bodies to 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 not deliver the level of savings we'd normally expect. And um, to one of the questions, I, I think we've seen um, value for for money remained important. So so setting aside efficiencies, we were still keen to make sure that the money we spent was spent effectively, and and we delivered reasonable unit costs on things we bought. So value for money has continued, as have controls on our expenditure during this time. We've just been less focused on efficiency. And um, what you can also see on this slide is this significant number of increased staff we've had to have to get through this period. It's a combination of of our existing staff working additional hours, bringing in agency staff and also recruiting as uh, recruiting staff that we needed um, in order to get us through, get us through the, the last few months. And um, if I could go to the next slide. Um, uh, I'm not going to go through the, the statement of financial position, which some of you might know as a balance sheet um, in any detail, but if I can pick out a couple of things, you'll see in kind of the current assets section um, receivables, um, which is money owed to us. You'll see that's gone down from 130 million at the previous year end down to, to 69 million. Um, there we, we had a system where we were receiving block payments monthly. Um, whereas previous years we've got paid for the activity we've done and therefore we haven't had the arguments and the disputes we would normally have. That significantly reduces the amount people owe us and that drops immediately into the line below that, which means our cash balance was significantly healthier because we didn't have lots of unpaid invoices from people. So that was a re real positive piece. Um, the other piece I'll pick out is in current liabilities. Our borrowings you'll see have gone down very significantly. Um, there was a change in the NHS during the year whereby trusts who've been running deficits for some time, which we are, of which we are one, we received cash support from the Department of Health to support that deficit position, which was which was given to us as, as borrowing. So it was given to us as debt. And um, in year the decision was made that actually that that borrowing should be converted effectively into dividend capital. So it's a bit like if the if the Department of Health and the government was a shareholder, they converted that borrowing into an investment in the organisation, which which frankly makes makes the balance sheet look a lot more sensible um, and, and therefore doesn't require us to have a very long term plan to, to repay some of that historic borrowing. And um, so that's very useful. If I then move on to my final slide, um, which is just to give you a sense of what we spent our money on, we spent £72 million pounds on capital. And um, what capital is, is spend on things that we will use across multiple years. So this is buying buildings, equipment, um, spend it, spending money on, on, on things of that sort. And um, the first thing to say is we, we received quite a lot of support to up the amount we could spend on these things during the year. So we received 21 million pounds of extra funding from um, from governments of one sort or another, particularly around COVID, but for other spending we needed to carry out. And we also received 3.7 million pounds of grants from the charity and other places in order to support uh, the spending we needed. So we've been well supported during the year on the capital program in, in terms of what we spent the money on. The COVID costs you'll see there 3.9 and um, quite a lot of equipment there. The new oxygen tanks people would have seen um, and some reconfigurations particularly to emergency departments to help us through COVID. We had 18 million pounds of capacity increases, particularly a major investment in increasing our ITU capacity of 8 million pounds so that we could cope with the, the influx of, of critical care patients. And that will stand us in really good stead in the future, having that additional capacity uh, and, and also 5.5 million on the adult assessment unit down in, down in um, um, urgent care at Barnet. So again, some real investments that will help us deal with um, the increased patient flows in the future. On IMT, we've got a combination of spend on um, improved patient systems so that we can do our job more effectively, as well as investments in infrastructure. So, so new PCs, new servers, new wiring to make sure that we, we are a digitally enabled hospital. Um, other building works there, our backlog maintenance, so that the day to day costs we need to just keep our buildings running remains a big number. Um, which is the majority of that 17 million we need to keep on top of the maintenance and repairs of our building. We were able to do that. 
and just very finally medical equipment um we spent 11 and a half million pounds on 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 equipment for for imaging of one sort or another so mri scanners ct scanners um equipment of that sort we spent an additional three million pounds on on ventilators and other critical care equipment um, during the pandemic, and then and then and then we spent money on equipment for things like the breast screening service. So a very significant investment into the trust during this time, some of which has got us through some very difficult times around COVID, but the vast majority of which will stand us in really good stead as we go into the future. So delighted we've been able to do that, um, and and that concludes kind of the very high level summary. The the accounts are available on our website for that, those who are in interested and um, but I think I'm probably passing back to Mark for, for uh, questions. Quest. Uh, thank you, thank you Peter, uh, thank you Professor Hughes, thank you uh, Caroline for uh, fantastic uh, uh, summary of a, a tremendously busy year to, um, uh, that we've had over the last 12 months. It would have been uh, busy uh, had it even not been for the pandemic and that's added uh, uh, additional pressure to the trust. Um, we're now going to move into a question and answer session um, and can I firstly begin by thanking uh, members who pre-submitted questions. I've got a list of your questions here uh, and also uh, members have been, as they've been listening uh, over the last 50 minutes, uh, been, putting, uh, been, been submitting questions as well. So I'm uh, from both lists, I'm going to um, start to uh, pick questions and ask colleagues uh, to address them. Uh, we are unlikely to have time to be able to cover all the questions. So I'm um, some of the questions which have similar themes, I will bundle them up and we will address uh, as many as we can on this call this evening. But please be assured that uh, we will uh, get all answers out and we'll publish them uh, and make sure that, that you can see uh, our responses to all your questions, whether you pre-submitted them or whether you submitted them this evening um, on the uh, function that you have. Uh, on Microsoft Teams. So firstly, I'd um, like to um, begin with a question around waiting times. Um, so uh, um, we've got a question here from a member. Uh, can you elaborate on what you're doing to reduce waiting times for surgeries, consultations, diagnostics, uh, and also services like blood tests? Uh, waiting times for months have become the norm, but it's not how it should be. And I think we can all agree on that. Uh, Caroline, please, your reflections. OK, thanks, Mark. And actually, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really um, it's an excellent question. And I, 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 I didn't speak as much as actually I perhaps I should have done when I was talking earlier. So right now we have over 90,000 patients waiting for something to happen. Mostly most of those patients are waiting for a consultation of some sort, but lots of them will be waiting for um, a surgery. Um, and of course, that that means that we have an awful lot of, lot of people who are waiting potentially in pain, who are anxious. So. Um, there are a number of things that we're doing and uh, this conversation will be replicated in every single hospital around North London and in fact around the UK. Um, we normally have a lot of people on our waiting list. And let me just start by saying normally, even before the pandemic, we would have had about 70, 75,000 patients potentially on our waiting list. So uh, the size of our hospital and the populations that we serve mean that lots of people get referred here um, and, and unfortunately they have to wait. So we're doing um, a few things. Let me say, say three of the big things. So of course, the first thing is, how do you increase capacity? Well, of course, you increase capacity by uh, getting more people to work or by paying the same staff that you normally have over time. Now, of course, as you'll have heard me say before, a lot of those staff are terribly tired and it's not sustainable to do that. So we've got to think about different ways of increasing our workforce, different ways of working, different clinical models um, and potentially recruiting different staff. So we're doing all that. Um, you mentioned the questioner mentions um, diagnostics and services such as blood tests specifically. So particularly around diagnostics, actually, we're working across North London to create additional diagnostic capacity. So look out for the community diagnostic hubs. Um, the one that we will be most involved with is in Finchley Memorial, but there'll also be one up at Wood Green. And actually, these will provide lots and lots of extra diagnostic capacity for us to make sure that we can uh, reduce that wait, that anxious time when patients are waiting. Um, we're thinking about um, different ways of providing services. So, of course, um, lots and lots of services provided virtually. Now, that doesn't work for everybody, and we know that, and our clinicians tell us that. So. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but we're really thinking about how we use technology in a different way to try and provide more capacity. And as I said, we're recruiting. So we will recruit as many people as, as we can. And if any of you have relatives that are thinking about working in the NHS, have a look at our brilliant careers website. Um, just Google Royal Free London and careers. 
um, because we're really interested in um, encouraging people to come and work in what still is undoubtedly one of the best organisations in the world. So workforce, extra capacity and changing clinical models, Mark. Thank you, Caroline, and uh, uh, support uh, uh, where you started, which is this is the number one focus for us uh, as a trust. Uh, so rest assured that it has all our attention uh, and uh, as we come out of the peaks of the pandemic. Um, next question uh, uh, diff, diff, or next area, we have a number of questions relating to uh, research and development. So Darylin, huge interest uh, in your presentation there. If I, if I may just uh, select a couple of areas. Um, does the research agenda have a commitment to promoting equity within health research such that patients included are representative of the local population and minority groups uh, receive equal attention? And it's an excellent question. Uh, and, and another question, whilst, uh, uh, whilst, you, uh, whilst you're, you've got the floor, Darylin, uh, how can doctors get more involved with research? Thanks, Mark. Thanks, so Mark. really great questions. Um, so we're absolutely committed to improving uh, equality in research access, both to our local population uh, and also to healthcare professionals becoming involved, making sure that we have uh, diversity in all of our teams. As we launch our strategy, that'll be a really important part of our thoughts is how to uh, increase recruitment across all of our areas. Um, in terms of doctors getting involved in research, so um, both doctors, nurses, allied healthcare professionals, we want a complete uh, multidisciplinary team involved in, in research at the Royal Free. I would suggest the first thing is to think about your clinical area, talk to your clinical leads, see what clinical trials are going on or what other projects are going on. Come along to some of our meetings where we're presenting research which is ongoing. Come and talk to me if people are really interested uh, in getting involved in some aspects of research. Way into research for, for young doctors is often starting to do audits, quality improvement projects, data related projects. So there's lots of way in and it's a fantastic way of uh, enhancing both uh, working lives and also uh, patient outcomes. Thank you, Darylin, really appreciate it. Uh, Peter Ridley, I might, might just warn you, the next question uh, might be a slightly cheeky one, but uh, we'll ask it. Uh, the Prime Minister has been talking about putting more money in the hands of the NHS. Uh, are you seeing any on the ground impact of this? Uh, yes, so um, there's been significant extra money, there's no doubt about it, from the Treasury, both in the first half of the year, so to the end of September, and just announced for the second half. So an additional six billion in the first half of the year and five five point four, I think it is, in the second half of the year um, for the NHS as a whole. Um, that money, uh, the majority of that money is to continue to deal with the extra costs of COVID, so infection control, vaccines and, and other costs of COVID. But there is a billion pounds in the first half of the year and the same in the second half of the year to deal with the elective backlog and we are seeing some of that in, in extra income come into us and what that enables us to do is to put on extra activity um, in any situation where we feel we can we can we can deliver that and we can we can demonstrate value for money so to come back to that efficiency point earlier, we are being supported to do as much activity as we can, um, understanding the waiting lists we have, and there is additional funding nationally that is coming to us to do that, and we just need to demonstrate we're doing that in, a, in, an, in an effective manner and a productive manner. Thank you, Peter. Uh, next, next area, Ragini, uh, if I may just prime you for a uh, number of questions actually about um, uh, staff morale uh, and engagement uh, are obviously absolutely critical. Uh, all our colleagues have had uh, the toughest 18 months in their working career. So uh, in particular around mental health, so uh, what are we doing uh, to support uh, nurses, doctors, consultants, well, clinicians, support staff as well uh, on mental health? Uh, and uh, uh, particularly as uh, uh, the person asking a question is highlighting as a, a big waiting list to see uh, therapists. So what are we doing to support our staff? Uh, and in the context of that, uh, another question, if you could um, elaborate on what we're doing to help attract and retain staff, please. Thanks, Mark. Um, just making a note. OK, so to start with what we're doing around supporting our staff with regards to mental health, um, during the whole COVID um, period, we stood up a health and wellbeing offer for all our staff, which included support 
um, support for mental health um, and that is still running and it's ongoing. That is uh, the funding for that has been provided by the charity for which we're very grateful for and that programme of work consists of five different levels of mental health support including um, support for individual staff members as well as teams because the thing to remember about this is teams have been experiencing um, different experiences depending on which team you are um, working in, in within the organisation. In addition to that, we also have our counselling services and our occupational health team available to support. So we have recruited additional uh, re resource through the funding that has been provided to be able to provide this support. In addition to mental health support, we have conti continued with our offer of um, uh, support um, for physical uh, physical activity and a lot of our physical activity and online class our classes resumed to going online for the organization and they are still continuing we also have our employee assistance program in place and with regards to staff morale and the question that you raised around that mark we continuously do a pulse check within the organisation to see what we can do to improve staff morale we recognise the and accept the real issues that there are in terms of staff fatigue and we are creating um, rest spaces across the organisation hopefully people will be aware of the rest spaces that have been created within the Barnet Hospital and we are working on um, uh, a suitable alternative for the Royal Free Hospital site in this regard. With regards to morale as well, what I would also add is that we continue to do the pulse checks through the staff survey. The staff, National Staff Survey will be coming out again in September this year. It comes around um, annually. And in addition to that, we've implemented the pulse check survey, which is, um, take, is taken forward monthly. And and um, management for the different divisions and different services are advised of the feedback and asked to put in place actions to address particular issues as they arise so that staff are able to really understand and see that we are making that difference for them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ragani. Lot, lots, lots happening there and lots more to do, uh, but uh, th those are really good questions. Uh, from members. Uh, we had a, a pre-submitted question um, uh, around uh, car parking and uh, and another one that's just come through on the Q&A. So let me just, just bring those questions in now. Uh, what steps is Royal Free Hospital taking for patients who are not able to use public transport uh, so that they can use private transport and use the parking at an affordable price? Um, and um, secondly, if you just give me a second, let me just get the other uh, and specifically on a, a Barnet Hospital site, um, uh, are there plans for a multi-storey car park? I think, I think generally, I think there is a, a, a from members uh, um, lots of questions around car parking availability and cost. Um, Caroline, do you know who who can best um, take this? Um, well, let me let me have a little go, and then because um, I know I know enough, I think, to give a bit more information. Um, and then if Andrew is on the call, perhaps Andrew can can sort of help me out. So um, just for those of you that use the Royal Free Hospital site, uh, if you've been recently, you'll have seen that actually we now have reopened the rebuilt car park below the Pears Institute. Um, and I think there's about 60 extra spaces there. So that's the first thing. So we're very conscious this is an issue for our patients and lots of people say that. So I'm sorry about the stress about trying to park near our hospitals. Um, and um, for those of us that, um, for, for those people that are worried about the affordability, so patients who are entitled to free or reduced parking rates can apply in their clinics. Um, and of course, blue badge holders get free parking. Uh, so that's important. Um, and, and I suppose it's also important to say, Mark, that all the money that we get from parking goes back into the services. So um, that's a, that's a um, sort of that always makes me feel slightly better about this conversation. In Barnet, we know that uh, we need to create some different parking uh, solutions, as they say, um, and we're thinking about how we do that um, in our in our kind of existing footprint. So more to follow on that as we work with Barnet Council on the kind of next iteration of the plans around that hospital. We also have a non emergency patient transport service. Many people will know about that um, for patients who are unable to attend hospital appointments by public transport. Um, and so uh, it, and where patients medical conditions are make them eligible for that, uh, then uh, they, they can apply. So 
so we do try it is an issue it's really difficult and i think it's a, i think in london transport to hospitals is something that we will continue to need to think about um and uh perhaps work with our governors so i don't know if andrew you want to say anything else about the uh potential parking solutions in either barnet or all free hospital I don't think we've got Andrew with us, Caroline. Oh, poor Andrew. OK, all right. Well, hopefully that was helpful. And if people want more, then we can respond separately. Mark, uh, as, as, against all these questions, we'll get res written responses out. So we'll uh, we'll make sure Andrew adds to that, uh, particularly around the car parking questions. Um, well, well, whilst you've got the talking stick, Caroline, um, uh, and we're talking about Barnet Hospital, it's a recognition that it's a and &E significantly under pressure. and. Uh, we all know that. So are there plans, this is a pre-submitted question, to reopen the A&E unit at Trace Farm? OK, so so thank you. Um, of course, all our emergency sites uh, are under pressure um, and um, uh, that is an absolute uh, consequence of the pandemic and the kind of here and now. I don't think that is necessarily what we will see in years to come, by the way. I think, you know, this, this is a uh, you know the 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 um how patients use a health service will continue to change there are no plans to reopen chase farm as an emergency department um the um the uh the 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 changes that we made several years ago are, are now how we choose to run our our urgent care systems in the north of the patch um and um actually chase farm urgent care center is really really good um, and we continue to get really good um, reports from patients who use it. Um, and it's there for anybody who use med uses med needs medical treatment or advice that isn't life threatening. Um, and that covers an awful lot of conditions. So, um, so, so the straight answer to the question is no, we don't have plans to reopen it as an emergency department, but it's a really, really good urgent care centre that provides a wide range of, of treatments um, and we can't do without it. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Caroline. I'm um, going to bring in a couple of uh, new areas uh, and, uh, just to open up the conversation. Uh, in advance of today's meeting, we received a number of questions about our digital strategy uh, and our investment in uh, digital capability. Uh, so in particular, how, how that aligns with our trust priorities, uh, people participation as, in, uh, as a part of that. So it's a broader sense that digital opportunities allow us to redesign our model and redesign how, how we operate. Uh, and there's particular interest on, on what EPR, so it's a patient record system, you know, the heart of uh, uh, um, uh, digital capability, what EPR we will we are and will be using. Uh, perhaps I could ask, uh, I don't know if Glenn's on the speaker bridge, uh, certainly it was the intention, uh, who is our uh, um, uh, head of our IT, uh, uh, department uh, to answer that, uh, followed by Ravi, uh, particularly in terms of how that's going to impact the trust, please. Mark, I think the the the, the duty of that has been passed to me as the Chief Clinical Information okay. Officer. All right, Alan, thank you. So if I start and then maybe Ravi can, can add into it. Um, so um, yes, we're deploying our new electronic patient record at the Royal Free site in Hampstead. And that's taking place on the 2nd of October. And that represents the extension of the EPR that we've already got at Barnet and Chase Farm. And just for information, we're also going live with that at West Hearts, so that in the Watford area. So that's a joint domain that has 1.6 million people on that. Um, it's through a company called Cerna, it's one of the, the larger providers in the world. Uh, the solution we've got is called uh, Millennium. Uh, version 2018.05. Um, so we're, we're deploying that in uh, the 2nd of October. Um, in anticipation of that being rolled out, we have already written our digital strategy and we took a lot of time and effort to do that well. Uh, we used a lot of patient voices within that and consulting through our member forums. Uh, also making sure that we, we learned the lessons of all of the deployments we've done in the past for the last 15 years uh, and we've taken a lot of advice from the end users. Uh, the digital strategy it, in essence is to provide an underpinning to facilitate the three aims that we have, which is our world-class care, our research and our teaching and education. It's there to facilitate and make these things better. 
But to do that, we've identified five themes. I'll pick out a couple of them. One of them is about the electronic patient record and all of the digital parts of healthcare. Uh, we want to be much better at uh, iterating, changing and bringing new digital products online. For those who have been involved in the raw free, you've noticed that it sometimes takes a long time to change. We want to alter the, the record, the EPR that we've got in, in almost in real time to make it uh, a fit patient needs and clinician needs because they're the ones that know best. That's one of our major areas. The second area is about data, our data strategy. Of course, we've got data now, but we've got data that focuses tremendously on business and we want to provide it better for the clinicians to make uh, more informed clinical decisions and also a different setup so that research can use that data to make more impressive insights than they already do. And one of the other st strands of the EPR, one of, uh, sorry, of the digital strategy I bring your attention to is innovation. What partners we, the partners we have can't provide everything. And actually a lot of our uh, clinicians and workers have innovative ideas and we've got to capture that. So we've been doing that for the last year and a half. We've got some real great success, some of which we've actually been using, given to the NHS. We want to mechanise and amplify that over the next couple of years. Um, just one other thing, which is as part of the EPR, we've got um, a research module that we will be uh, deploying soon afterwards uh, just to make the experience of uh, research quicker, uh, less bureaucratic, giving more time to the patients and the uh, investigators. And um, one last thing is about our patient portal, which has 130,000 people that have signed up to that. Uh, at the moment, clinical appointments and uh, letters, uh, diagnostic tests are in scope, but in the future that will be a better way for us to communicate and maybe actually um, uh, schedule treatments and communicate directly with the doctors. I'll leave it at that, Mark, unless there's any further questions. No, I think that's uh, that's really comprehensive, Alan, and it's great to see the uh, ongoing uh, move towards uh, digital and investment in that, uh, whilst recognising, of course, that uh, uh, the human touch is very much still needed uh, within healthcare provision. Um, Julie, I was wondering if as our group chief nurse, you could address uh, a, a couple of areas for us. Um, and uh, I, I don't know how um, easy it is to answer some of these, so, so it might be we, we'll get back offline uh, and, and publish our answers. But uh, is the Royal Free planning on rolling out any preventative tests uh, or research so that one can minimise critical care and medical emergency triages? So it's really about prevention and upstream. So I thought it's important to, to bring this out and requires a lot of system working. Um, and. Uh, and secondly, just you know, uh, your your chief nurse perspective on, on how um, how we manage patients with long term illnesses who do not wish to travel uh, and are, are, are fearful of of the uh, well, quite rightly uh, nervous about COVID and the impact of that. And so, uh, any reassurances as um, a group chief nurse would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, and I hope everybody can hear me. I have had some issues with my teams today, so I, I can take the second one, Mark, but I might ask my colleague Chris um, to add in some elements regarding your first question. So in relation to the question about our, our patients um, who have long term illness, and this is a really important thing, I think, going forward. And one of the main um, emphasis for us, I think, as an organisation and for me as the chief nurse and director of infection prevention control is to make sure that our patients feel safe um, and, and safe at all times. And I think probably with this one, um, what we would try to do going forward is try to accommodate um, virtual appointments where that is possible and where it's feasible and where it's appropriate for the condition and for the discussion that needs to take place. There may be some situations where a physical um, assessment needs to be undertaken and in those circumstances I think it's really important to provide reassurance to our public and our population that if anyone does need to come into the hospital that the hospital remains a safe place. We still have kept our restrictions in place such as the wearing of PPE and also social distancing so we haven't moved to removing um, those restrictions and that's in line with, with all other organisations organisations and healthcare settings. So it's both of those offers really. It's trying to make sure we maintain the virtual um, world that we have 
been really developing, I think, over the last year and a half, but also if individuals do need to come, it's that reassurance that it, they will be safe. I think in relation to the first question, I think we've got Chris on the line who might want to come yeah, in happy to regarding come in. prevention. Thank you. Happy to come in. Can you hear me all right, Mark? Uh, we can, thank you. And uh, apologies, thank you. I didn't realise you, you were on the call, Chris. I was looking at sort of speaker list, but... Uh, yeah, no, 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 Mark, don't worry at all. Um, so, in, in an ideal world, we, we want to, you know, critical care, our critical care performance and the, the outcomes of patients on our critical care units is very, are very good. But in an ideal world, we want to stop them getting them in the first place. We, we, we did do quite a lot during the COVID outbreak in terms of advanced care planning to make sure that, that the right people got there. But the other thing that's been a bit of a an odd beneficial side effect of the crisis is a lot of lot of staff from other areas had to work on critical care during the worst bit of the crisis, and actually that meant that a, a larger number of our staff developed you know critical care skills, which then they, then they could take back to the ward, and we 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 haven't measured this in any formalized way but it does mean that we've we've upskilled a larger group of the workforce that that hopefully can help us prevent people getting there i think the challenge in the future which which um um Gillian and I have been uh, the the medical director of the Royal Free and I've been having some discussions about is how we we modernize our our sort of critical care in the future so that it's got a it's got the capacity to deal with crises like this in the future but also there's a flexible workforce that works outside critical care that can move in when it's necessary and i think if we formalize the sort of stuff that happened during the crisis we've got the opportunity of having a, a sort of empowered workforce in other areas which i hope will stop people you know getting to critical care so it's, it's so so i think there's there's some stuff we've done but in some ways it's a it's a work in progress and it's really important that we deal with it thanks uh thank you chris uh that's that's really really appreciated um and uh i, I think as we look uh, you're quite right as we look to the future of the nhs prevention and um how, how to bring activities uh, 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 much earlier in the life cycle, and actually everybody's uh, general health and well-being, both mental and physical, uh, is absolutely critical uh, to to managing uh, the right the right healthcare outcomes for the population. Um, we're, we're we're reaching uh, near the end of our Q and A. I believe between the uh, the questions that were pre-submitted and the questions that were coming in, that I have covered uh, um, uh, all the big topics. Uh, we do have some very uh, some more specific questions around, uh, for instance, uh, what are we planning to do with uh, a, a, a taxi of suff sufferers? Do we have plans for specific sites like Queen Mary's? Uh, we also have um, through the question some really helpful suggestions, such as you know, um, for instance, uh, 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 can we promote civility saves lives as a campaign that will help? Uh, uh, address tension and bullying among staff and so on and so forth. So we'll take all that away where it's a suggestion, uh, rest assured we will definitely um, uh, consider them. Where it's a question, we'll make sure uh, you get the responses. Uh, as some of them will require a little bit of uh, um, uh, research on our part um, and to get you the right response. Uh, I would like to uh, like to finish uh, with a particular uh, uh, question from uh, a member. Uh, learning from excellence, uh, also known as Gratix, uh, is a fantastic initiative to promote and celebrate excellent care and interactions uh, between colleagues. It encourages uh, great care and boosts staff morale. Can we have renewed commitment from the chief executive uh, and governors uh, uh, to promote such initiatives? Uh, Caroline's um, spoken to me about this already. So it's a very timely uh, question. It is an amazing initiative. And the answer to your question is a resounding yes. Uh, you can have a renewed commitment from all of us uh, to promote this uh, initiative uh, uh, across the trust. Uh, could I thank uh, please all members for for really great exchange of views uh, through these Q and A's. Um, it's amazing questions, uh, really good probing questions, challenging questions, very supportive uh, questions as well. So thank you so much, uh, uh, and thank you uh, actually over the last uh, twelve months uh, for your great, uh, great, great support of the trust. Uh, with that, I'm going to uh, hand back over to Sneha. Thank you, Mark. That's a great uh, Q&A.
Um, so as as I promised earlier, we will we like to hear from you a lot and we'll be sharing governor's inbox details quite shortly with you where you can send your suggestions, comments, feedback so that we can uh, we are continuously engaged with you and we keep listening from you. And finally, uh, after this event, we'll be sending a short survey out where we'd want to learn from you as to what more do you want us to cover in these sessions and whether you like the format and how interactive it was because your, uh, your suggestions are very, very valuable for us. So overall, really, really uh, thank you for attending this event and a big thank you for the to the exec team and the non exec team for holding the fort during the COVID time. So really appreciate your time today. So thank you a lot until we see you next year at the next AGM. Thank you. Bye.